They fought in muddy, bloody battlefields and died in trenches alongside their countrymen, just like Canadian soldiers. But Germany was the enemy in the First World War, and so the German perspective on those events is not often considered. Well, joining us now to help us understand the German mindset at the time and the role the country played in the war is Deborah Neal, history professor at York University. Welcome. You're Thank laughing because you. You, 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 you talk about a unique perspective that we don't hear very much. Yes, and the Germans are, of course, at the center of the storm. Mm. So um, uh, there's just so many things to say about, about them and what they were doing and, and, and what, what responsibility they hold for the outbreak of World War we're I. We're going to talk about all those things. Yeah. But, I, but before we get into the Germans in, in particular, I just want to um, talk a little bit about Europe at, at the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Just sort of paint a picture of Europe then. Mm -hmm. So obviously, very different uh, kinds of experiences depending on where you are on the continent. But we could say a few general things. Um, Europe is doing very well. It, uh, it's, it's a place full of very large empires and the, uh, the nation states of France and Germany and Britain all have colonies across the world. Economically, it's booming. The, uh, the, the Germans in particular are going from strength to strength. They're, um, they're building one of the most robust economies in the world. Um, the British are at the height of their powers as a great imperial nation. There's a lot of optimism amongst ordinary Europeans. Mm. And part of it is because on top of being, of having a sense that they matter and that they're, they're, they're at the center of, of, of global change, there's a democratizing force in a lot of European countries. So ordinary Europeans have much more of a say in what goes on in their countries. Literacy rates have risen. Uh, there's more participation for women in public life. It's, it's a slow process, but it's happening. Um, universal suffrage is introduced um, after 1871 in Germany and, of course, elsewhere. Um, it's, it, these kinds of political changes are slower in Russia, but overall you have a time of great optimism. And technology is giving people a lot of hope. Um, the airplane, first decade of the 20th century, um, you see airplanes, you see uh, the rise of the automobile and the telegraph, these great um, communications and transportation uh, advances. Mm. And I think we, we identify with those things. We also live in an age where there's optimism and a belief in and a hope in technology. And so in, we hope. Yeah. yeah. But there's a dark side. Mm. And the dark side is very dark indeed. It's a very violent place. And even though there's no war on the continent, uh, many of the European powers are fighting very violent racist wars in the colonies, wars that they call wars of pacification. Um, and at the top of these societies, very small elites control uh, much of the power. Uh, aristocratic elites, monarchs, so they're unelected, and they over, o overly rely on their militaries, and there's a strong military culture. And sometimes what you see is the military having more of a say in political and foreign policy decisions than maybe they should. Okay, well, let's get into the, to the yeah. leadership in, in Germany. With Kaiser Wilhelm II, mm -hmm. what's his vision for Germany when he comes to power? He's very young, and he's just uh, taken over. Um, he dismisses Otto von Bismarck, who was the elder statesman of Europe, and he wants to chart a new course. He wants Germany to have what he calls their place in the sun. Um, and so he, he wants to build a big navy, and he wants to uh, have Germany's rights in their colonies and elsewhere in the world recognized. He's not afraid, as he thinks, to stand up to the powers of France and Great Britain. Um, and on the other hand, he wants to be popular. He wants to be liked. Um, he, he is, in some respects, an authoritarian monarch, but the people of Germany have a voice through the Reichstag, and he's also very sensitive to public opinion. So on the one hand, he's a sort of old-school conservative authoritarian wanting a, a, a strong, powerful Germany, and on the other hand, he's, he's trying to fit into the modern world. Mm. And, and he's, he's a difficult personality, mm. certainly. And his vision is one where Germany takes its rightful place amongst the first world powers. Okay. And so he's trying to be popular with his people, which is... Well, it depends not, on the day of the week. Right, but not unlike <laughs> most politicians, to be honest. Um, how strong are the feelings amongst the, the population uh, of Germany, feelings of nationalism and militarism at the time? Oh, there's a lot of literature that indicates that Germans are fiercely nationalistic, and they support some of these bold foreign policy moves that their government makes. Um, they, they, they're united in war. Um, the, the war against France in 1870, 1871, it, it ends with the founding of the German Empire. Um, there's a great deal of pride in German military exploits and a belief in the military, and a sense that as a united power, 
they they deserve um, uh, they deserve to be recognized as a leading nation in the world. And so there's a strong and fierce nationalism, but. Underneath it is a society that's very deeply divided um, along class lines. Germany has the largest working class party in Europe. And there's also simmering tensions between that party and the aristocratic elites and even the middle classes. So as much as they're united in their belief in a strong and powerful Germany, internally, there's a lot of tensions in Germany. And what's the relationship? How are relations going? Uh, with Germany and the rest of Europe at this time. They're all sort of going mm -hmm. through the good times, as you pointed out at the beginning of our conversation. What's the relationship between Germany and the rest of the European powers? Well, it's, it's contradictory the same way how we see Europe in general before mm. 1914 is contradictory. G Germany and Great Britain uh, have an enormous amount of trade between them. They are, their economy is very interconnected with most of the major economies in Europe. And uh, the peoples of these countries are deeply invested in each other. Um, transnational peace societies, uh, the vegetarians, believe it or not, the, the um, uh, literary societies. And so you have a lot of person-to-person of, of -person, um, getting along. But, but foreign policy-wise, there's a great number of tensions and problems between the powers. And it really starts with the demise of what Otto von Bismarck had hoped to have, which was a very loose set of alliances. The, the big fear was, of course, the setting up of alliances with fellow Europeans that would create armed camps. Okay. And under the Kaiser, that's exactly what happens. Um, they, they, they lose their closer relationship with Russia. Russia and France draw closer together. Um, and they utterly fail at uh, keeping the British um, happy, the Germans do, up to 1914, even though there are genuine attempts to get along with Great Britain. And within the context of all of this going on, I mean, our, and, and the spirit of nationalism, mm -hmm. how, how badly, I mean, do Germans want war? Are they like, let's go for this thing? Or what's sort of the mindset at the time about war? Oh, it's such a tough question. Um, there's this image in 1914 of all of these uh, ordinary people crowding around and chanting for war and and desperate, you know, we'll, the Germans are, we'll, we'll be in Paris by Christmas. Mm. And, um, but there's a, a few um, new studies that look at public opinion, and uh, it, these studies seem to suggest that people were much more divided on the possibility of war than we might think. And even though they were enthusiastic in 1914, um, th there was resistance to, to wars and, and to the idea of going in, into another European war. The pr I think. Where there was support for war, people had this very romantic notion of an older, um, more chivalrous age. Mm. The, the, the ni I don't think war was ever chivalrous, chivalrous and glorious, but this 19th century romantic notion of valor and heroism on the battlefield. So even those who are keen on perhaps going into a war against some of these other powers, they don't understand the kind of war that they're going to get in an age where the technologies have dramatically changed. So where there is support for war, uh, I definitely think there was a real misunderstanding of the kind of war that they might face in 1914. So when we talk about World War I, I mean, there were a series of, of crises that, that preceded um, mm -hmm. Austria-Hungary uh, declaring war on Serbia in, in 1914. Problems uh, in the colonies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like Morocco, conflicts yeah. in the Balkans. Yeah. So help me out here. What was the tipping point that made that the start of the war? Why, I mean, why didn't anything else tip the scales into a full-fledged war? It's a, I, I mean, I, there's whole books written on this, and I still <laughs> don't know it, the answer. Answer in yeah. a minute. <laughs> um, I, I will say something. I'm a colonial historian, so um, I, I will say that I've, I've looked a lot at the question of why was there never a war over colonial tensions. And it's a good question, um, but the Morocco crises really are a result of Germany wanting free trade with Morocco and wanting an influence in, in that part of the world, and France resisting it. Um, and uh, Germany actually has, has, they're not entirely wrong in their uh, desire to, to be there vis-a-vis -vis France. I mean, the, the, French are, um, the French are not blameless. But the Kaiser actually says during the first Morocco crisis, uh, I'm, there's no way I'm going to war over Morocco. Sure. Whereas it's not the kind of thing they say about the Balkans. And I think the colonies, as important as they are, they are unlikely to rally public opinion the way a war happening in Europe's own backyard is going to rally public opinion. Furthermore, the Balkans have been a tinderbox for a long time. And Bismarck himself once said, if there's going to be a general war, it's going to be because of, be because of some damned foolish thing in the Balkans. Mm. Um, and Bismarck, as usual, was witty and 
right, um, <laughs> uh, whatever you may think of him. So uh, part of the problem in the Balkans is that you have three major empires that are deeply invested, and that's the Austria-Hungarians, the Ottomans, and the Russian Empire. And in particular, in the crisis of 1914, you have the clash of the Russians and the Austria-Hungarians. And so it's, it's more deeply personal for those powers, um, and the Balkans in general are, it's such a complicated part of Europe, it hits very close to home, home for, for the powers. And all of the great powers have a stake here. I mean, if there's a war over Morocco, um, you might not have every single power drawn in the way you might over a war in the Balkans. Okay. Yeah. So Germany allied, is allied with Austria-Hungary. We've right. talked about its relationship with the rest of Europe, sort of in quotes, yeah. as this banner thing. But what, how close was this relationship between Austria-Hungary and Germany? Very close. Very close. They share a common language. Um, the royal families are related. The, um, the, the southern parts of Germany and Austria in particular are uh, very, very similar in culture and uh, outlook. Um, after they, they have a war in 1866 that predates German unification. But after that war, the relationship becomes very strong. And part of it is they don't have the same geopolitical interests, or at least we could say their interests are complementary rather than competing. Whereas Germany's relationship with Russia is a little bit more tense, and Russia's relationship with Austria-Hungary is very tense um, because of, for example, the problems in the Balkans. Mm. So um, Germany's natural inclination is to support Austria-Hungary. Under Bismarck, they try to maintain better ties with Russia. But as we get closer to 1914, you see the ties between Germany and Austria-Hungary strengthening and those between Germany and Russia becoming uh, more problematic. Okay, so uh, assassination of Archduke Franz mm -hmm. Ferdinand is a spark that you know, eventually lead, leads to war. How do events from, from the German perspective sort of unfold from there? Yeah, um, so Austria-Hungary, um, they, they, after the assassination, I mean, this is a big deal. The, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, he's the heir to the throne. He's the heir to the empire, and he's killed. And Austria-Hungary, there's, and there's, there's parallels here, if you'll allow me to talk about this. This is a terrorist organization that has attacked the heir of a major state, a major empire. And the major empire feels it has to make a strong showing of, of, of retribution for this. It's, it's furious, and we see this in our in our own time with with uh, challenges to to empires. And the Austrian-Hungarians, um, before they do anything, they feel they need to check in with their ally because they know that they're going to upset Russia if they go after Serbia because Russia considers Serbia to be a major ally and and has vowed to protect them. So I think the Germans they don't help themselves by offering this infamous blank check hmm. to Austria because it emboldens the Austrians to draw uh, a firmer line. And with this blank check, what the Germans say is, whatever you decide to do, we're going to support you. And now, the message that that sends to the Russians is, if we have to defend Serbia with a war against Austria-Hungary, we're going to have to go to war against Germany, too. So all of a sudden, you, you, the conflict is immediately wider. So the blank check is a, is a turning point in the, in the crisis. If Ferdinand hadn't been assassinated, I mean, would there have been uh, a, an, another, another <laughs> what if, you know, what if question. thousands of books yeah. written on this, no one's come yeah. up with the definitive answer, but I'll ask you, <laughs> if Ferdinand hadn't been assassinated, would there have just been another catalyst or would the war might not have happened? I don't know. I just don't. I've thought about this question so often. I mean, it's, it's incredibly unlucky that it happens at this moment um, under these circumstances. Mm. And and to this particular man. Because Franz Ferdinand was a reformer compared to some of the other members of the Austria-Hungarian elite. And he was attempting to modernize the Austria-Hungarian empire. And he was, he was, by all accounts, sincere about that. And the, 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 the tragedy, in a way, is Austria-Hungary was not as damaged or in as bad shape as people people think. Because it collapses in 1918, we have this idea that Austria-Hungary is a very weak state. But I think there was still hope for it. Mm -hmm. And um, not that I'm an advocate of empires, but the tolerance for a variety of ethnicities, I, I think that Franz Ferdinand was going to attempt to make those changes. So the, the historian Chris Clark talks about it being an improbable war and that uh, at every stage, different possibilities are closed off as they, they race towards this conclusion. But it's so alluring to look at those possibilities and imagine a slightly less sure. awful outcome. And I do think that 
as limited as our as our ability is to for conjecture, I do think that there was a possibility for a better outcome. If there was going to be a war later, perhaps it would have been on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. um, but it will never know. History revisionism. Yeah. It's all fun, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Another another big question for you. When you look at <laughs> the entirety of World War One. What's the biggest mm. game changer moment? I mean, obviously yeah. the assassination is the spark and a huge game changer, but, but other than that, what's the big game changer? So, I mean, no matter what I say, there'll be lots of people who disagree with it. Um, first, I think the failure of the Schlieffen plan is the, is the, the, big, is the big game changer. And it, it, I say that, it's a bit funny because it happens in 1914 and the war goes on for four years afterwards. But the Germans are unable to deliver that knockout blow um, because they're facing a two-front war, of course. Because once Russia and Germany are at war, France supports its ally, Russia. And so now Germany is faced with this conundrum. And, um, and it realizes it has to knock France out quickly. And so it comes through Belgium, um, which of course brings the British in because the British have guaranteed Belgian neutrality. But it has this moment where if it could just defeat France quickly, and that was the whole point of the Schlieffen Plan, then it, it could turn its attention to Russia and knock out Russia, and it fails. And it fails, it actually almost succeeds. But when it fails, what you're faced with is essentially a war of attrition. Mm. And that's a war that Germany is gonna, it, it, it's gonna be very difficult for Germany to win that war because of the naval blockade, um, the British are dominant um, at sea. Germany has historically relied very much on imports for feeding its population. So in a war of attrition, Germany is likely not going to be the last country standing. The second one is the battles of Verdun and the Somme. And they're interlinked because the Battle of Verdun is the worst battle of the war. It, it takes place over almost all of 1916. The Somme is introduced in the summer of 1916 to try to relieve French troops who are fighting the Germans at Verdun. Um, upwards of uh, 750,000 men, uh, German and French soldiers, are killed or wounded at the Battle of Verdun. It's the, one of the worst battles in human history. And the German inability to win this one is really is a, is a turning point in, in demonstrating inability that they can't win. Uh, the turning point being a strategic one strategic or a moral one. loss? And, well, if they can't win here, I don't think they can win. Right. Um, they do try again with this massive push in 1918. But the, the Verdun, I mean, the initial, uh, one of the generals, the German generals said, you know, our goal is to smash it so not even a mouse is left alive. They, they do that but they end up basically where they started. Mm. Um, and so their inability to get out of this entrenched uh, uh, system of warfare demonstrates that they can't win the war. And is this, I mean, saying that, is that through sort of the lens of a historian with the ability to look back? Absolutely. Or, or the, the Germans at the time, did they know that this was, this was sort of it? The, the jig's up, right? Or yeah. It, it, I don't know. I, I do. Th I think that there was always hope that the Germans, the, the German high command, believed very strongly in its military. There was always hope that if not this battle, then the next one. But it's becoming increasingly clear that it's a race to win over uh, the collapse of not the collapse of the home front, but the inability of the home front to con to continue on. I mean, after the war, the the, the right wing German nationalists blame the home front for losing mm. the war. They talk about the stab in the back myth, but. The recognition that you can't go on building bombs and 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 dipping deep into your uh, financial coffers to finance this war forever. So they need that it's it, they're becoming increasingly desperate from 1916 on. But it is worth noting that the French army almost falls apart mm. um, in in 1917, and and the Germans don't actually really know about that. But so in other words, it's not so inevitable that the Germans uh, will collapse first. But um, it, the, I would say that the, the, the more uh, um, thoughtful of the German military planners are increasingly worried after Verdun because this was supposed to be the knock at, uh, and, knockout and, blow. I mean, what's going on domestically in Germany at the time? What's the, what's the mindset of the people? Um, increasingly radicalized. The, um, the Germans are putting radical communists in jail, um, like Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Um, because their message about the criminality of the war is gaining a little bit of traction. Um, people are literally starving through the so-called turnip winters. Mm -hmm. Because of the blockade, they can't get the kinds of supplies that they need. And the, the feeling is one of increasing desperation. And by 1918, essentially, there's a series of protests and strikes and, and revolutions in Berlin and elsewhere as the population basically stands up and says, we we can't we can't continue indefinitely
So things are getting increasingly desperate on the German home front. Okay. And then the end of the war at the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, talk to me a little bit about how that, what, what effect the treaty has on mm -hmm. Germany, beyond the obvious, you know, reparations not paying them and all those things. What's the effect on Germany? Well, because it's very difficult to, to determine who the aggressor was in 1914, I mean, there's no question that Germany plays a major role, but mm. they're not the only uh, power who plays a role in, in creating this massive crisis. The fact that the Allies insist that Germany has to take the blame for the war, Germany, Austria, Hungary, is, is psychologically very damaging to the German people because, and in fact, because of wartime censorship, I don't think that, I don't think that there were as many Germans as you might think who realized just how dire their situation was in 1918. And remember, the war is not really lost on the battlefield. So when the Allies come back and say, the war's all your fault, you have to pay us massive uh, reparations, and you have to, in writing, sign something that says the war was all your fault, mm. that is absolutely devastating to the German people. And it's, when you think about the amount of sacrifice that all of the warring powers, their societies made, made to win, not winning, is just a, a devastating problem. Mm. And then on top of that, you have the financial collapse of Germany in the early 1920s and the long road back from that. So uh, the, the German people, this is a very scarring experience, not just the war itself, which is enormously scarring on a personal and, and societal level, but the, the idea that it was their fault, which they felt was a profound injustice. And in fact, it was very hard to find members of the German government who were actually willing to sign the Treaty of Versailles. As a historian, is it a profound injustice to sort of pin this on, on the Germans, that they are to blame? Um, they, they are certainly uh, one, of the, one of the powers that are to blame, but they're not the only one. Mm. And uh, a more just peace would have perhaps acknowledged the role that the other powers played as well. Um, and historians since then have been much more ready to acknowledge the role of the other powers. I mean, Russia orders mobilization, um, bef and Germany, I think, legitimately sees that mobilization as, as a threat to them, even though the Russians say, oh, we're not, you know, our focus is Austria-Hungary. Um, uh, the, the Serbians themselves, in Chris Clark's new book, Sleepwalkers, he, he talks a lot about Serbians as, as playing a, a fairly significant role in the outbreak of World War I, um, even though they later become, in a sense, a victim of, of, the, of the war. But, so to blame it all on Germany is, I, don't, I think, not an accurate reflection mm. of the historical record, but it served rhetorical purposes and it served practical material purposes because if Germany is to blame, then Germany has to pay. And it serves as a pre pretty easy narrative too. And we crave mm. easy narratives, right? Yeah. You know, all that said, still Germany is singled out, right? Yeah. You know, it's sort of like you're to blame. Were there any options for Wilhelm Helm? I mean, could he, I mean, looking back again through yeah. history, that he could have taken to avoid war? Yeah, I mean, the Russians wanted to take the problem between Austria-Hungary and Serbia to an international diplomatic conference. Wilhelm II um, was very influenced by his military planners. And um, in fact, it's Germany who declares war on Russia and France. Um, but part of that is because the military are saying, if we're going to strike, we have to strike quickly because of the Schlieffen plan. So um, the, the, the Germans, if they had been less inclined to think in terms of diplomatic and political, sorry, if they had been less inclined to think in terms of military solutions and focus more on diplomatic political ones, then you might have had a different outcome. Mm -hmm. um, but once the military are thinking about strategic objectives, those doors start closing. So this summer we're talking about the uh, you know, First World War in many perspectives, trying to, yeah. to try to really understand and, and get, a, a, get a broader understanding of how the various pieces all came together and what we're supposed to take away and legacy and things like that. When you look at the war 100 years on, what, what is it that's important to know? How do you see it? Um, I think it's not as far away a world as we might think. I think there's things that are very modern about the conflict and the lack of easy answers is troubling because we like to think that we can avoid this kind of thing in the future. But when it's a very complicated problem, sometimes you get, it's not so difficult to get tripped up. Mm. And I mean, this is a war that starts with a motorcade and bombs and uh, the assassination of a, a, a future head of state. Um, it's uh, uh, essentially the Austria-Hungarians overreact. And um, I think that we can envision this kind of problem now. Um, it's, it's also the great first tragedy of the 20th century. And it, it, as a direct result of World War I, 
many of these other tragedies follow, the, the violence of the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War. I mean, you, you wouldn't have had the Russian Revolution without World War I. Um, the rise of Hitler and the Nazis and the, the, the devastating Second World War. And so the World War I is, is, I think, of continuing fascination for this reason. And it's also something that is fruitful to study for understanding mm. the present. It's at the table. It's at the table, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jennifer, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.